VSSD calibration of laser ablation, CPMS, strontium mass of analysis of low strontium 2 phenomenon. And yeah, we look forward to seeing that. Uh, what do you know? Brian? Yes, Brian. Brian, okay. Off you go. And off your stress. <laughs> <laughs> So, hi, my name is uh, Bryony. I'm currently a PhD student at Durham University and at the British Geological Survey. Um, and I've been working, this is part of my PhD project, looking at uh, mobility in cattle predominantly. Um, but the first part of the project was reassessing the potential of using laser ablations um, to determine uh, micro sampling and se uh, sequential sampling through the tooth. Um, so there are two main methods of doing microsampling for strontium isotope analysis, um, and here we would be interested in the ratio of 87 to 86. Um, there, are, there is microdrilling with TIMS, but also you can use uh, solution plasma spectrometry or laser ablation plasma spectrometry. So microdrilling and then either TIMS or solution plasma is the current gold standard and and it produces reproducibly accurate and precise results. However, it's considered to be quite expensive and time consuming and can take several weeks to run 15 to 20 samples. It also requires clean laboratory facilities, which not all um, places will have. Conversely, laser ablation is being perceived as more rapid as it takes less than two minutes per sample and that includes the washout time and moving from sample to sample within the um, enamel, but post-analysis data processing takes a considerable amount of time and can take several weeks or months afterwards to actually process the data before you can interpret it. It doesn't require column chemistry, so it doesn't require clean laboratory or technicians in order to do this, and it's perceived as less destructive. And while this is true in relation to bulk sampling, where you take a large sample and look at the average of the tooth, the microdrilling samples are just as small as the laser ablation samples. Isobaric interferences and microdrilling are removed through this column chemistry, which means that in the laser, because we don't do it, we don't remove isobaric interferences. An isobaric interference is an interference which sits on the same mass as the element that you're interested in. So particularly the problem with laser ablation is the interferences on mass 87, which artificially raise the 8786 value and alter your interpretation of the data. So interference on mass 87. Most papers who have published laser ablation data, data um, report seeing higher than expected strontium 87, 86 values. Um, and this is either compared to what they were expecting or the published TIMS values for samples they've already done or the TIMS repeats that they did of their own data. Some papers consider this to be negligible within uncertainty and don't affect their interpretation, while others attribute it consider it to be significant and attribute it to either calcium phosphate or argon phosphate, both of which have mass 87 and both of which are potentially produced during the ablation of carbonates or, well, high carbon, not high carbon, sorry, calcium, high calcium um, substances such as tooth enamel. And you can't remove it because you're not doing any chemistry and everything that is ablated goes straight into the mass spec. Some authors don't detect it at all. Um, and interferences where they do appear appear to be machine specific, with some machines producing it all the time to varying degrees, some machines producing it on some days but not others, and some machines appearing to not produce any interference at all. And different groups use a variety of different methods to negate this interference from different tuning conditions, so how you set up your mass spec, to how you uh, process the data afterwards or apply calibration equations. So what I did here was I used the two mass spectrometers at the NIGL, or two of the mass spectrometers at the NIGL suite, the Thermo Neptune Plus and the New Plasma HR, which is a plasma, New Plasma 1, but has a New Plasma 2 interface. And we coupled it with two of the three laser systems they have there and a selection of known concentration, um, but varying strontium concentration, varying isotope ratio, um, geo and bio appetites, including a variety of different enamel from different species ranging from 103 ppm strontium concentration up to 656 ppm and geoappetites ranging from 400 ppm strontium concentration to around 4300. So in an ideal world all of our data would sit along this line, which it doesn't. 
So this is comparing the uh, voltage of 88, so the most abundant strontium isotope, to the accuracy or the bias of the um, ratio, so the measured ratio that we got in our experiments to the TIMS value, which is either published or the ones that we calculated ourselves using TIMS. All of the all of the same samples have the same symbol, so all of the ones that are Durango, have, which is a geopsite, have a little circle, and all of the samples from the same run have the same colour. But it doesn't matter too much about the data, we just, these are our low strontium enamel samples to squares, which are quite far away from the line, and these are our higher strontium appetites, which are a bit closer to the line. But even these ones, which are our sort of high strontium enamel samples, aren't sitting exactly on the line one. And I don't have any error bars on this graph because it would make the next one really difficult to read. Um, so this is the Neptune and the previous slide was the mu. So here the values do sit a little bit closer to the line but they also have a higher concentration, no, a higher strontium 88 voltage and potentially the reason they may sit closer to the line is because we don't have any of these higher, they appear to sit closer, we don't have any of these higher um, signal samples. However, this sample is the same sample as, if I go back a slide, this one over here. So we're getting a huge difference between our beam size of the same sample just in different runs at different settings. Um, we're also seeing the new the Neptune appears to be behaving, or this Neptune appears to be behaving slightly better than this new because we get we don't get any of them really, really far away from I mean, this is still not good values, but they're not quite as far away from the other. So we also tested some of the different tuning conditions. We've tested 15 different tuning setups, and this is the two, these two previous slides are a combination of both. Um, and one of them that's been published and suggested to be a good method for reducing this interference is low oxide tuning. So we tune for low oxides and maximum sensitivity on both the new and the net tune. So this is the new data. Um, these are our really bad samples. So normally, low oxides are thought to make better, produce better data than tuning for maximum sensitivity. But in this instance, these are our low oxide samples and these are our um, maximum sensitivity samples. So actually tuning for low oxides made the values worse, probably because they reduced the beam size and at lower beam size, there is more potential for interference. But if we zoom into this bit over here, we also see that the symbols are the same one, so the closed symbols are the low oxide and the open symbols are the maximum sensitivity, that they're not pushing them any further up, sort of away from the line one with the bias, but they are just pulling them back in, the beam, in terms of the uh, beam intensity and the sensitivity. And we did the same for the Neptune, but in this case, it appeared like tuning for low oxides did improve um, the results and create a sort of less biased, more accurate value with this one, the open symbols being the low oxide and the closed symbols being the maximum sensitivity. So the maximum sensitivity one here is further up and away from the line one, which would be what we would want. And we do have the error bars, but if you also notice the error bars on here are really quite large. So what, so we have, ooh, so we have our sort of 12 of the tuning conditions that worked because we had three tuning conditions that produced no data at all. And all of the same symbols are the same sample. So it kind of shows that we have a big range of the values that we got from this sample, which is exactly the same as this sample down here, which is our 103 ppm, so our low <coughs> strontium sample, but actually 103 ppm isn't that low. So here it appears that run three and run seven on the Neptune, the different tuning conditions gave the best uh, results. But interestingly, Session number two and session number seven were the same tuning conditions, six months apart, but they still give different data. But what does this mean for archaeological samples? So these are all of my samples that we ran, um, the, just but we've split them by bioappetites and geoappetites. So the reds are the geoappetites and the blue are the bioappetites. And if we take the Evans 2010 map and apply the same color scheme and assume that one is 709, um, they're all different. This is what it would look like. So you can see that the interpre any interpretations you took from these numbers would be very different from the sample from their other values, which sit down here in the sort of 709 range as opposed to the 713 range. So we clearly can't use data that 
like this one up here, but we wouldn't necessarily know unless we tested all of the tuning conditions what was going to create good data or what was going to create bad data or less good data. So we can also apply correction regressions, and this is another thing that has been proposed by a variety of authors as to be a good way to correct, correct for this interference. So I tried to create regressions for all of my data sets, and these were the best four, which all happened to be on the Neptune. But you can still see that the R squared values of these regression lines are not always very good for applying a regression to correct for data. So this one, Neptune 1, 3, we have a nice um, R squared value of 0.9, but this one up here has an R squared value of 0.5, which really doesn't sort of doesn't instill confidence. And these are all based on, with the exception of this one, because I had to take out this, which is uh, Durango, which is a, a geoappetite, which has very high rare earths, which cause interference. But these are all based on the average of the part from that one, which is based on all of the spots apart from Durango. Um, but we also have these runs, which run four, which doesn't produce any regression at all. So <laughs> Even the 0.5 R squared was now looking quite good. Um, so when I apply the regression, it doesn't always make the data much better. So this was the run three data. I didn't apply the one with the lowest R squared value um, because it just means that instead of being too high, we still have the values, but they're now seeming too low and the error is still huge. Now these regressions don't include any of the propagated error from the regression equations. Um, but just include the machine error. So these error bars would be even bigger if we applied the propagated error from the correction equations as well. But these were our two best uh, correction regressions where they do sit along the line of one. But even here, we have the really, really large error bars on our low strontium 103 ppm enamel samples, which really aren't that low in the grand scheme of things. So while the best tuning conditions appear to be run three and run seven, when you look at the graph of just the tuning conditions, when you try and apply the regressions, actually the best data that we get out at the end is from run six and run seven, but you wouldn't necessarily know by looking at your data when it comes off the machine that run six was gonna produce sensible values or what appear to be sensible values. So in summary, we can see this interference on all and interference on both machines at BGS, but we don't know exactly what, what it is. We're only correcting for it because we think it looks right, or we think that the corrections we're applying look right. We've been invited to repeat this experiment at a further three, two machines, at a further three machines at two different institutions, one of which has a collision cell and one of which is a prototype at Bristol which I think has a different kind of collision cell. So we might be able to improve our data this way, or we might see different problems with different machines. Um, the BGS Neptune appears to produce better results from the BGS New, but that doesn't mean that all Neptunes produce better data than all News, or even that this Neptune produces better data all the time. Because some days we had runs where it started off looking sensible and then it would just drop halfway through. The same tuning conditions do not always produce the same degree of bias. So as we show, showed with uh, the two runs that had much bigger error on one day than on the other when the tuning conditions were pretty much the same. And the published method of tuning for low oxides does not always produce less interference. It did on the Neptune here, but it didn't on the new. We can create a regression for some, but not all runs, with varying degrees of successful correction. As we don't really know what we're correcting, it only appears correct. We're not sure if we're actually dealing with all of the problems that we might potentially be encountering or just the ones that we think we can see. So I'd like to thank my supervisors and NERC Iaptus for funding me. Um, and thank you all for listening.